Dr. Stephen C. Meyer of the Discovery Institute goes on Joe Rogan to discuss the existence of God. And Rogan once again peddles a book that one historian called, quote, the most ludicrous book on Jesus scholarship. And the Barbie movie comes out and pushes feminism and more dangerously, Gnosticism on its young, impressionable audience. As we look at how the director, Greta Gerwig, sees Barbie as a means to push her own views on morality, creation, and even her own Apostles' Creed. Stay with us as we look at these and other stories on the 511 News. Welcome back to the 511 News. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And on today's episode, we're going to be looking at a number of different topics, but specifically what recently happened on the Joe Rogan Experience and what is happening today as the new Barbie movie is released. But before we get into that, we would love for you, if you feel so led, to make sure to subscribe to the Good Fight Ministries YouTube channel, as well as, if you feel led, to leave a five-star review on whatever podcast format you might be listening to this on. That just helps us get up the algorithm and so forth so more people can hear. And for those who are asking how can you support, one way that we love to have your support is to have you guys on Patreon. We put a little more of a personal touch. You guys get to see a little more of our lives on there than anything else. And it's just a fun way for you guys to support us. You can go to patreon.com slash goodfight. But Guys, I am really excited about this show. One, because I was excited to sit through th over three hours of an interview on Joe Rogan that I think, if I remember correctly, only had one curse word. And that is because somebody that we have interviewed in the past, Dr. Stephen C. Meyer, someone who in the movie Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, that he was featured in, played a role in me being more open to the gospel when I was coming out of atheism after watching the film, and then I would ultimately give my life to Christ a couple months later when I watched They Sold Their Souls for Rock and Roll. And so I was excited because I sat down with Stephen C. Meyer back, Dr. Stephen C. Meyer, back a little over a year ago to discuss his book, The Return of the God Hypothesis. And I found that discussion really enjoyable. And so I was excited because many people will point out that Joe Rogan has brought on Christians like uh, louder with Crowder, uh, Stephen Crowder, and they haven't done such a good job of defending true biblical Christianity, or you could have people like Candace Owens as well, and I don't believe that either one of them, sadly enough, are actually brothers or a sister in Christ. And so you haven't seen them be able to answer any of the questions that Joe Rogan might posit. And with this interview, when I watched it, I was really encouraged because Stephen Meyer really did a great job of expressing certain truths. I'm not going to agree with everything on him. And I think if he was more open to expressing some of the demonic things as well um, that were going on, I think that that would help to express some truth there that might be missing in the interview. But ultimately, I thought it was great. And the fact that he actually had someone real on that actually knows what they're talking about. But with all that said, I, I there were some points, and I want to give you a little bit of my own review. There were some points I was a little frustrated with, uh, one of which is the fact that that I, I love this because I wrote this down as a quote when I was watching it because something that he said that cracked me up, there was a couple of things where every time, the word time, that uh, Stephen Meyer would appeal to, this is what the data says, this is where we're at, this is what we believe, so forth— you would have this appeal that you say, well, don't you think if it had more time to do it? And I love Stephen Meyer's quote. It was, time is always the hero of the plot. And I love that he said that. And when Joe Rogan and him would have a little bit of back and forth when he would get pressed on certain issues, Joe would have to appeal to things that I don't know if he's appealing to these because he actually believes them or if he's appealing to them to just simply trying to be a reporter given the other side. Because sometimes it was kind of embarrassing, if that's a position he holds, that he continued with Stephen C. Meyer to, to go over and over again, oh, well, what if it was this? And couldn't it be this? And one day, maybe we'll be able to discover more. Maybe we don't know. Maybe there was actually more information uh, before and so forth. And he, I really believe Dr. Meyer did a great job of pinning him down to where he had nowhere to go on a lot of these things. 
And Joe would appeal to different things. And sadly enough, when discussing the resurrection, I thought this was probably the funniest part of the interview uh, for me personally, as I'm listening. And he did uh, mention different scholars that Joe Rogan could talk to. And I hope that he does talk to some of them. But one of the things I thought was funny is as he's laying down the groundwork for the fact that we have good historical evidence to believe in the resurrection, Joe Rogan quotes this and he says, quote, Is it historical evidence or is it historical statements of people who were discussing a thing that may or may not have happened that might have been legend? Well, much historical evidence is also historical statement. It's, it's testimony. It's a very weird position to hold to that, well, those are just what people thought happened. Well, yes, this is how we do history. This is how we understand it. And one of the great things that Meyer was doing was expressing that even those who didn't believe in Jesus, those who didn't follow Jesus, still had to agree with the things that took place after. And the resurrection is a great place to start. Now, with all of that said, I want to bring up something that he brought up, and we've talked about a lot, and that is the sacred mush and mushroom and the cross. This is something that Joe Rogan brings up a lot, and I want to give this before we play the video. Now, we also interviewed uh, Wesley Huff, who's working on his doctorates, and one day we'll call him Dr. Wesley Huff, but we interviewed Wesley Huff a, a while ago on this because I noticed that this was coming up, and sadly, it has continued to be peddled by Joe Rogan. And I want to read something before I play this video on debunking this idea that he peddled to Dr. Meyer and Meyer didn't know about it. It was like, he was like, I don't, I've never heard of that, but it, that it's so ludicrous. And I use that not just lightly. I use that because that's what scholars say. In fact, Allegro's theory, John Marco Allegro is the one who came up with this theory. And he's, he was a legitimate scholar in terms of being involved with the Dead Sea Scrolls and so forth. But Allegro's theory of a shamanistic cult as the origin of Christianity was criticized sharply by Welsh historian Philip Jenkins, who wrote that Allegro was an eccentric scholar who relied on texts that did not exist in quite the form he was citing them. Jenkins called the sacred mushroom and the cross, quote, possibly the single most ludicrous book on Jesus scholarship by a qualified academic. Now, I say all that to also give you some of the arguments against it that Wesley Huff will give in this short video. What guys like Joe Rogan, um, who is a big proponent of psychedelics to begin with, uh, what he talks about on his podcast occasionally is the work of an individual named John Marco Allegro. And now John Marco Allegro was an legitimate scholar, biblical archaeologist, and Dead Sea Scroll expert. And I think some people, when they like hear what what sounds like, and I'll explain what it is, a crazy theory, and then they look the author up, they go, well, uh-oh, you know, this isn't some wackadoo hippie. Um, this is someone who was a, a legitimate individual within the academic institution who was one of the original scholars who investigated the Dead Sea Scrolls when they were discovered. And so that can throw people for a loop. Um, the problem is uh, that throughout Allegra's publications, what he does is he connects the development of language to the development of religious narratives and rituals. So he used etymology, which is the study of words, and connected particular important words in the Bible and uh, a few other ancient religions to hallucinogenic experiences from plants. So based on that, he came to the conclusion that Jesus did not exist, that the Gospels were a hoax, and that what Christianity turned into is nothing more than a misunderstanding of ancient fertility cult rituals uh, in the object of the worship of a psychedelic mushroom. Now that sounds crazy when even it, I say it like that, but this is, is what he published in this book titled The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. And one thing to keep in mind is that uh, no scholar from any background, whether that's religious or secular, either in Allegro's day or now, accepts Allegro's theory and its conclusions. It's because when you actually start to evaluate what Allegro says and the way that he comes to those conclusions, it, it's, just, it's just not the way you would come up with concluding that a historical figure, Jesus of all people, didn't exist. What he does really is it's based on a, a, a genetic fallacy, uh, which is the etymological fallacy. And that states that a word or phrase's 
truer proper, proper meaning is derived directly out of the oldest meaning of said words or compounds or components of said words. So not only does Allegro basically ignore all of the evidence for the historical Jesus, not only does he kind of ignore all of the things that we can derive from the historicity and reliability and trustworthiness of the gospels, he kind of brushes over them and he doesn't even, he doesn't even address them. Um, and I think ultimately that's the strongest rebuttal is, you know, if Allegro is, is trying to come up with this theory that Jesus never existed, well, you can't just leave the mountain of evidence aside and then just start asserting something else uh, despite that. Even if we leave that aside, the way that Allegro starts to get his conclusions uh, for trying to connect hallucinogenic experiences through the study of words, it's, it's based on a logical fallacy. We don't trace the meanings of words and how they were originally used to the time frame that they're being used in a particular instance in order to come up with their meaning. I mean, uh, I use a number of examples in the video uh, and I'd encourage the listeners to go watch that on my YouTube channel. I think the one I use is um, awful. You know, that um, uh, the word awful, uh, even just a few hundred years ago, used to mean full of awe. But if I wake up in the morning, I turn to my wife and say, honey, you look awful this morning. You know, it's going to mean something else, right? She's not going to see that as a compliment. That's going to be an insult. And so there's a different meaning. It meant something originally, but it means something completely different now. And then there's words that don't even have the, the necessary uh, uh, derivatives of the components that make up that word. Something like butterfly. The butterfly, as you know, the insect, has nothing to do with butter. And it is not a fly. I guess you could argue that it flies. But um, when you analyze the etymology of that word, it doesn't necessarily get you to a conclusion to tell you what that word means or how we should understand a further meaning behind that word simply by breaking apart the compound words. This is what uh, Allegro tries to do time and time again. And even scholars within those particular linguistic fields in philology when they evaluate this stuff, they say he's really not making as much sense as he thinks he's making. So um, it's very popular in uh, with Joe Rogan and in particular circles that want to promote uh, particularly psychedelic mushrooms. But I think at the end of the day, it's it's super, super fringe. It the it doesn't add up when we actually evaluate the data. And despite it, it's sounding very um, maybe interesting. Uh, it. It really, it's it's a lot that comes to naught. So as I believe Wes does a great job there of expressing how ridiculous the argument is, I do want to uh, kind of shift gears here, but I want to say I am excited that Joe Rogan brought someone on there and I do hope and I pray that he is coming to what is the truth. Uh, sadly enough, I do believe, just as it talks about in Hebrews chapter 12, that there are things that are weights and there are things that are sins that can easily entangle. And that's even for believers. And it says we need to lay aside those things. I believe when it comes to his views on drugs and so forth, that's why he wants to hold to these ridiculous kind of views on this book. And I, I really, really do believe if he could lay aside those things, there'd be an opening there for the gospel. And I have people that are mutual friends with him that I've talked to that say, I think that there's a chance. So keep him in prayer. We would love to see him repent. The problem is, is he's so deeply ingrained with Satan when it comes to some of this uh, drug, some of the drugs he pushes onto people and Terrence McKenna and all this stuff that he pushes. So so keep that in prayer as well. But I do want to move up and and start talking about the movie Barbie, the Barbie movie that is coming out, because just a little bit of research on the director is going to point us to the fact that this movie, not only by their own admission, and you can hear them talking about it with uh, Margot Robbie and the director, Greta Gerwig, where they talk about how the movie is about feminism, but not just feminism, but even humanism as well. It's interesting that they, we stood in the little that, you know, was able to be understood about the film in advance. Clearly Mattel still talk about it in slightly different terms to you two, mm -hmm. but somehow, you know, they don't like to call it a feminist film. Mm. The actors seem very comfortable with talking about it as a feminist film. Yeah. But somehow it doesn't matter that you talk about it differently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it most certainly is a feminist film. Um, uh, and I think the, the sort of... Can you explain that? Why, how, how so? I, to me, it's like that's like one slice of the pie. 
Like it's so it's pretty big. It's slice. a it's a big <laughs> slice, but like I, I don't know. I, yes. I, I no, I know. It, I also wouldn't yeah. call it a funny film because then yes, that discredits true. the yeah. fact that it's got it's a lot of heart film. and it's got a lot of emotion and it's got a lot of like movie references. You know, all this kind of stuff. I'm like, it is funny. That is a huge part of it. It's a comedy, right? But. Yes. If you just call it a funny film, you almost make it sound like it doesn't have a lot going on, and it does. Well, I mean, like this is this is sort of it, when we talk about this stuff, it's it also it almost sounds silly because you <laughs> you start talking about Barbie and Ken, and you're and then you're having very serious discussions mm. about Barbie yep. and Ken, but it's like, I mean, I think to to whatever that sort of of like. It's also a humanist film. Mm -hmm. Now, Greta actually made her stardom. I guess her directing debut with Little Women. And you can go into some of those interviews and see a little bit where she's at. And she talks about how her senior year, she went to Catholic school and she had an affinity for the priests and the um, and the nuns and, and so forth. But hearing about and reading some of how she got this job, how Margot Robbie chose her to be the director, and then listening to interviews about what she's all about, knowing that she made a mockery of what is known as the Apostles' Creed, and in doing so, did it to present this new Barbie movie. So Gerwig really is someone who is not obviously not a Christian, but it is interesting some of the things that she has done. In, in, in fact, in Vogue, it says this, in Barbie land, Ken is basically another fashion accessory. Barbie has a great day every day. We are told in the voiceover delivered by Helen Mirren, Ken only has a great day if Barbie looks at him. Mattel introduced the first Ken doll in 1961 in response to letters demanding Barbie get a boyfriend. Quote, Barbie was invented first, Gerwig points out. Ken was invented after Barbie to burnish Barbie's position in our eyes and in the world. That kind of creation myth is the opposite of the creation myth in Genesis. And now she has talked about Christianity and so forth regarding uh, her going to Catholic school as a senior. And one of the things she's talked about, even when she did Little Women, is getting away from the Victorian age morality and so forth. And it's really interesting because I found a tweet. I was wondering what people were saying and, and critics were saying. And I want you to see what somebody noticed regarding the new Barbie movie or the movie based on a doll. But nonetheless, I want you to see what someone other, someone else is actually pointing out regarding this movie before we get into a little bit of the plot. Quote, yeah, so I think maybe the Barbie movie is sort of like Barbie eats from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. My mom, no, poor Barbie. Me, she shouldn't have to know. Now, I point that out because I did wonder myself if she's trying to flip the creation myth, as she calls it, from Genesis. And, uh, you know, just thinking, moving ahead and, uh, you know, looking at what's going on in this film and finding out that the plot line is basically that they are in Barbie land. But when a deficiency is found, they're then kicked out into the real world. And it starts to parallel a number of films like Pleasantville or like even the Truman Show. And maybe you're saying, Chad, how do you know this movie has anything to do with the Truman Show and so forth? And what is the Truman Show? And is it even, you know, Gnostic or anything like that? I want you to see a couple things. One, here is the director saying that was the last movie that she actually watched before actually filming this film. First off, on behalf of Letterboxd, I'm very excited to tell you that Barbie is the most watch-listed film of 2023. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yes, yes. That's incredible. The Thanks. Barbie community is out, like they are ready for this. But speaking of watch lists, you, Greta Gerwig, have a watch list for us of 29 films that influenced the look and script of Barbie. Anyway, I think I actually kind of hit all, oh, in Truman Show, of course, because yes. Truman Show. 
I, is amazing. I was going to ask because that's the most modern movie on yes. your list as well, which yeah. I, I appreciated your going back yes. into the classics. Well, yeah, and I had to include Truman Show both because I watched it again before I made this movie and because Peter Weir very generously got mm -hmm. on the phone with me. And what I want you to see as well is not only her admission of that and seeing the influence in this film and also seeing that's interesting that everything is perfect and then a blemish is found and now they're thrown out into the real world. But also that does seem like what's going on in the Truman Show. And if you guys haven't seen Hollywood's War on God, one of the things I want you to see is over and over again, and this is from a Good Fight Ministries, this was originally a film that was exposing the Da Vinci Code. And then what it turned out is that as Pastor Joe Schimmel did research, he found that film after film after film are pushing this same mystery religion, this same Gnosticism. And it looks like Barbie alongside transgenderism, alongside feminism and humanism is pushing a lot of this same nonsense. The Truman Show is a movie about a man named Truman Burbank who was adopted by a corporation before he was even born for the express purpose of exploitation in the reality show. After his birth, he is placed in an artificial world on the phony island town of Sea Haven, which unknown to Truman for the first 29 years of his life is really a Burbank studio, hence his birth name, Truman Burbank. Truman is unknowingly viewed by millions of people in the television audience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for the rest of his life as thousands of cameras record his every move. Say something. You're on television. You're live to the whole world. His artificial world is filled with actors and actresses carrying out a script for the entertainment of the world as well as the ego of Kristoff, the evil creator Remember, and director of the show. With just one. Kristoff lives in a celluloid world above the sky viewing Truman's every move, which is monitored from the moon station, which is a control center for the show. However, Truman Burbank comes to the Gnostic revelation that life is a scam and that he lives in an illusory world and finally realizes who the true man is within. It doesn't take a genius to realize that beyond the surface of a reality show gone overboard, that the two men most responsible for manipulating poor Truman's life are named Moses and Kristoff, or C-H-R-I-S-T. OF, Christ off. Unmistakable references to both Moses and Christ, the central personages of both the Old and New Testaments. Even as Truman finds the true man within, we also discover that Christ is way off as he seeks to exploit others to his own twisted glory. Just as God offers Moses the promised land, so director Peter Weir states that, quote, what Christoph proposed to Moses was unprecedented and staggering in its scope. He showed Moses plans for a new studio on a large parcel of land in Burbank, California. The studio was designed by ex-NASA scientists who had been working on a sealed environment for humans to live and work. As the Truman Show progresses, we not only discover more and more about Truman, but we discover more and more about the evil creator. He goes from being a control freak to one that flies into a rage. In the end, he loses his hold on Truman and is defeated. He is depicted as a monstrous creator who derives pleasure from being in control and watching another live a lie. In the film's climactic scene, Kristoff is revealed to be an evil manipulator. Truman makes a heroic attempt to escape Kristoff's phony world by a sailboat. Kristoff, filled with wrath, loses control and rains down a thunderous storm upon Truman's head. Kristoff is intent on stopping Truman from escaping, even if it means drowning him. Notice that we get another clue as to what's going on here when we see the boat number, boat number 139. We see number 139 on the boat when the boat is sailing, but we also see that after Truman recovers from the capsized boat, He's clutching the sail, and the director wants to make sure that we see that 139 all over again. This is significant because in the Bible, Psalm 139 is all about God seeing everything. In Psalm 139, the psalmist talks about God knowing the psalmist's location and his every thought. Psalm 139 states, quote, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise to the wings of the dawn, I settle on the far side of the sea. Even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely darkness will hide me, and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as a light to you.
for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. After nearly drowning, Truman fails to turn back to Kristoff. Kristoff finally speaks directly to his, quote, son, end quote, from heaven. Truman. <gasps> you can speak. I can hear you. Who are you? I am the creator of a television show that gives hope and joy and inspiration to millions. Then who am I? You're the star. Was nothing real? You were real. It's what made you so good to watch. Listen to me, Truman. There's no more truth out there than there is in the world I created for you. Same lies, the same deceit, but in my world, you have nothing to fear. As in Gnosticism, Truman recognizes his own power over Kristoff, and appearing to walk on water, he makes his ascent up into a door in the heavens to find freedom from Kristoff's restrictions. Actually becomes his own savior with the help of the fallen star, the help of the woman at the tree, and self-discovery. Ultimately, the crowd is made to celebrate Truman's salvation from the evil creator, Kristoff and Moses. It seems that director Peter Weir, through the Truman Show, purposely sought to get people to question the authority of their creator. Weir stated, quote, Truman lived on, unaware that his life was unlike any other. After all, why should he doubt his world? It was all he'd ever known, as real to him as ours is to us. Now, a lot of people are looking at this and say, oh, it's just a doll, we're going to go, everything's going to be fine, it, it's just a film for kids. But it's PG-13, one, I, I don't think it's just a film for kids, but I think a lot of moms who grew up with Barbie dolls are going to be taking their daughters, and sadly enough, even their sons, to go see Barbie. And in fact, she actually came up with her own blasphemous apostles' creed in regards to Barbie that she is not even releasing to other people, but when she was pitching the idea. So you see these religious ideas being put forth here. And what I see over and over again is something that we understand the Bible is a culmination. Our faith is a culminating faith, that we're looking forward one day to being with Jesus forever. And the fact is, is a part of that culmination is the fact that the world will get more and more wicked. The fact that people will be jaded, uh, the people that no, will no longer see good for evil and evil for good, that people, as they look at things, they won't have family love. There are a lot of things that are going to go by the wayside. And I do believe that when we look at church history, the first, and I mean, really the strongest weapon against the early church was Gnosticism. It was this entire movement, and I don't see any reason to not believe that that isn't something that is happening in the end times. All these things that we watch, all of the movies and whatever it is, the drugs and all this, and you're seeing these things pushing forward ideology, pushing forward ideas, pushing forward a milieu that is going to be prevalent in the end times. And the truth is, is when we see it, we turn from it and recognize the truth is found in the gospel. And that we get to be with Jesus forever if we are in Christ. If we are not in Christ, we are going to be deluded, given over because we will not believe the truth. And I don't want that for anyone. The truth is, is that Jesus Christ, unlike what Joe Rogan thinks, that he happens to just be a mushroom that people were getting high off of, unlike that, Jesus Christ, this isn't something told by some weird guy coming up with a weird thing that even Sumerians don't believe in. Jesus Christ died. He died a public death. This isn't a private thing done with using mushrooms. He died a public death with a sign over his head next to other criminals to say his crime. But the problem is Jesus committed no crimes because if he committed any sin, then he has a blemish and he isn't the perfect lamb that takes away the sins of the world. But he is is the perfect lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. And because you have committed crimes, I have committed crimes. He paid for those crimes. So on the day of judgment, when we are looked at, it's not how many good things have you done? No, no, no. What God will see is, are you ready for the punishment or has the punishment been paid? And Jesus Christ said, to tell us I paid in full. 
My crimes, your crimes have been paid for on the cross. You look to him, put your trust in him, come to know him and cry out to your Abba Father. If you know Christ, cry out to him. All who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. Turn to him right now before it's too late. Put your trust in him. Get to know him and read his word. This has been Chad Davidson. This is the 511 News. Thank you guys so much for watching 511 News. You can check out some of the older episodes as well as the Good Fight Radio Show and videos we have right here on our YouTube channel. And this week's featured product is The Submerging Church. You can check this out at goodfight.org. God bless you guys.